a little bit chilly this morning, but it is warming up. Slowly but surely. Back to long summer days again. Right, one or two more people still arriving. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Already. So just by way of introduction, my name is Peter Alkerbach. I'm a postgrad student here at WITS um, in the Faculty of Engineering. And this morning's workshop is going to be tackling this concept of writing with clarity and meaning. And we'll also be covering a number of other related ideas, obviously around the production and revision of a report, which most of us will be having to write at some point in our postgraduate career. Um, we will not be dealing with the, the article or the contribution to a journal um, style or nature of reporting. Um, but more the end product of your studies as in a thesis um, or something of that nature. All right, is everybody in the right workshop? Okay, so um, it's just the morning. We'll be taking a break uh, about midway through. Um, we don't have a lot of heavy content to cover. This is very much going to be a conversation. And I think there's a lot of knowledge in the room that we can all benefit from. Um, so please feel free to ask questions as you go. I'll also prompt us, and um, we'll have a lot of interaction about various different topics. And if we need to spend more time on something and sacrifice some other areas, then absolutely you can do that. We are also recording the session, um, and as I've promised uh, in the newsletter that Hildegard has been sending out, we're actually also live on Periscope. So if somebody wants to log in from anywhere around the world and have a look at this lecture, they're more than welcome to do that. I think it's the first time we've done that um, at Vince University, which is quite groundbreaking and innovative, which is fantastic. And being in engineering, we do try and break um, <laughs> um, All right, let's get started then. And just by way of uh, the agenda for this morning, so we can keep off on time, and we'll just have a look at some goals and expectations, and I'm just keen to make sure that I calibrate the workshop to your expectations this morning and as I say we can fix it if we need to. I've, I've done some preparation but quite happy to, to change it as much as we need to. Um, we'll look at then some topics around the importance of writing well and in academic life the ability to write well is a fundamental capability that we need to spend time on. There are many other fields and enterprises that you will spend time on which may require other types of communicating skills, such as presenting, such as conversation, such as dialogue. And arguably you'll use all of those in your research and your postgraduate life. But ultimately, what is the final proof of your skill and contribution to your area of knowledge is what you can put down on paper. And that knowledge base in the world today exists primarily in written form. Obviously we are diversifying a lot more into sound and video, but I think what we put down onto a series of pages for somebody else to digest and understand and learn from our contribution to that field of knowledge is not going to change for the foreseeable future. So the ability to construct sentences, the ability to choose the right words, the ability to write with meaning and clarity is important in your postgraduate lives. Does anybody disagree with that? I think we can all start on that basis. And really, um, this workshop today was born out of um, my love for that topic, my love for being able to communicate effectively, and also uh, through my interaction with other students, you know, perhaps the need for us just to talk about these issues and for us to find ways of getting better and share tips and tricks, and we'll go through a lot of those um, in that session that we'll talk about there just now when we uh, discuss the importance um, of writing well. We'll also touch on differences across academic fields and to be honest I don't have that answer. I was in the bookshop uh, earlier this morning waiting for the library to open and I picked up on the top of a pile a book about writing in the medical field and I had a few minutes to spare so I flicked through it and I actually might go back and buy it. So anybody here from there? A... Okay. It wasn't specifically about medical writing per se. There was a lot of medical writing 
themes that came through it as I just quickly scanned through it. But if I looked at the chapter topics, if I looked at the examples, it was all about sentence construction. It was all about choosing the right words. It was all about not using jargon when you can use a simple word. Don't use a complex word if you can use a simple word. If you don't need to use a word in a sentence, take it out. So even in the medical profession, where for me there is a lot of complexity and technical jargon and so on, the advice of this writer in that book to his medical students writing reports was keep it simple. Make sure that people can understand the sentences and the paragraphs that you're putting into your reports. But we'll also look at maybe a couple of the other fields that will take a, a cross-section and we'll find out from all of you the fields that you're in and your experiences specific to your faculties and your schools. Because there might be differences. There might be unwritten rules and codes uh, and approaches to writing reports and writing for clarity and meaning that are specific um, to different areas of research. Then, just before we hit the break, um, we'll look at elements of actually producing your report. And really, if we run this workshop again next year, we might spend a bit more time on that topic. It's quite big in terms of the whole project of producing that report. Um, what I really want to get to is, is the session after the break, is the actual word by word, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, approach and construction. Um, aspects that we'll look at, which go into obviously the drafting and the writing report. But before we, we do that, we'll, we'll take a bit of a helicopter view of this idea of producing a report. And we'll look at some topics at high level just to, to give you some insights about that. And I'm well aware that you've all written reports, you've all been through this process, you've all got lots to contribute. And I really do urge um, that you do so this morning. As I said, break will be at quarter to 11, and if somebody can just remind me to turn the kettle on at 10 minutes before the break, otherwise we're not going to have boiling water or a cup of tea and coffee. And I'll tell you, um, I don't know if you like me, but if I don't have a nice cup of tea at some point during the morning, I really struggle. So if it's coffee for you, or um, just please remind me, let's, uh, let's turn the kettle on before the break. And then as I said, revising style, and we'll I'm not going to go through too much detail. We're just going to take a couple of key concepts that I found useful. And I often find when I do presentations and do workshops, we're going to talk about things that are passionate to you and that, that are meaningful for you. There's a vast number of different ways of approaching the English language, grammatical sentence, and paragraph construction. I've pulled out a few that I found useful, and as we talk about them this morning, hopefully you'll find them useful as well. Also, very important thing, just by way of a show of hands, for who in this room today is English not your first language? Wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. So, that is part of the reason why I'm so passionate about doing this, specifically in our context, where the world's literature in the academic arena is predominantly in English, right? And if we go and we look at the databases and the sources, it's all in English. And it feels to me sometimes that you know we, we just have to put up or shut up. You know, it's all in English and we all just have to go and learn that language if it's not our mother tongue. And that's a real challenge. So for, for those of you that put your hands up, I salute you. You've had to learn another whole language before you can apply it into the world of academics. And I feel that I didn't have to do that and I feel that's an advantage and I'm grateful for that advantage. But it's a barrier that you can overcome and it's a barrier that I'm hoping I can help you with this morning. Because I haven't learned another language. I spent some time in Italy, I learned Afrikaans at school and I said a few Zulu speeches at school. And I don't have a knack for learning another language. I know that. It's not a skill of mine. But what I do feel I can contribute to other people is to break things down into very simple, understandable, practical terms, right? And hopefully as we go through this idea of what is style in the English language, and let's, let's be very clear about this, we're talking about English language here. There are style and grammatical and communicating concepts in all the languages of the world, and they all have a very rich, diverse, nuance and understanding and means of communication for people that use those wonderful languages. The simple fact of the matter is, and we're not going to change it, 
the world of academic literature is predominantly in English. So let's learn about it. And I'm also learning, I'm on this journey with you as well. So, as you can see here, a couple of key principles that we'll look at. Literally, as you construct those sentences word by word, as you construct those paragraphs, and as you build up your report over time, your objective must be to communicate clearly. To make sure that your reader understands what it is that you have in yourself that you've learned and now wish to contribute into that body um, of knowledge. Alright, and then we'll, we'll wrap up at about quarter past twelve. There'll be some course evaluations and then we're done for the morning. Alright, as I said, if we do this workshop again next year, we could build out an afternoon. We could go into some more detail about producing the report. And um, I've also come across some good writing tips um, from uh, elsewhere in the world that relate to life as a postgrad student. And there are a lot of other topics uh, that we could use to build out potentially an afternoon session. And I'd really value your thoughts if we do run this session next year, whether that's something that you'd be interested in. Maybe going into more detail in some of these areas or broader topics around postgrad life that relate to. Um, the contribution of knowledge as a, as a researcher. And then very importantly, most of the content from this morning comes from this book over here, Craft of Research, which is really excellent and I highly advise you to, to get yourself a copy. Um, I bought a, a soft cover, you can get it on your iPad as well of course, but I really think that that's one of the few books that you keep on your desk you make notes, you highlight, you go backward and forward, and it's the one thing that as you go through your degree, you can keep coming back to. Because as Stephen Covey says, you think with that end in mind, and what these guys do very effectively is help you focus towards the end goal, which is the production of that report. I uh, met up with a fellow postgrad student the other day, and uh, she reached out because she was really struggling. She's uh, in the medical field and she's doing a PhD um, on, a, on a certain topic and she's struggling because she has produced a lot of material. She's done a lot of writing and she's gone down a lot of different paths in this process. And she's now at this deadline stage almost of, of having to produce this report and to having to show some progress. So although in research we are encouraged to think divergently and to explore lots of different topics, ultimately we need to converge again onto a document that is our contribution to research. And we sat and talked through some ideas about how she can get an overview of the landscape of her research with the intention of starting to bring it back together. And one of the things that these guys do very well is if you read the book from the beginning of your journey, as perhaps if this lady had done so, you know, maybe she would have been in a better position, but it's never too late to, to address these kinds of issues. There are ways in which you can start from any stage in your research and apply the principles of this book. But if you read it at the beginning and you apply it and you use it and you practice some of the tips and techniques in this book, um, you'll be ultimately in a much better position when you come to, to producing a book. So I make no claim about the originality of any of these topics with regards to academic research. I am lifting them out of this book, okay, and discussing them here with you this morning. And as we go through the slides, you'll see that I make reference sometimes to specific pages, sometimes to specific chapters. There's a whole section in the beginning half of this book on warrants and arguments, which I found quite dense and difficult to apply to my research, which doesn't require that approach. But the second half, is around this production of your report and your ability to write with clarity and meaning. So a craft of research, I really advise that you just get a copy or share somebody's or get it on your iPad. Um, come and look at mine afterwards if you, if you want to get an idea of what's in the book. Alright, good morning, welcome, great to have you with us. for the workshop this morning. What did you come here expecting to learn or to achieve or to contribute as part of our discussion this morning? 
For those of you who just joined us, we've been through the agenda for this morning. We've spoken about what we're going to cover, and we've touched on some introductory concepts around um, producing a report, and then the content of that report around ensuring that your style and grammar, etc., is well constructed. So, anybody want to suggest the reason why they came here this morning? What it is they want to get out of the session today? Yes, sir. Brilliant. Okay, to improve his writing skills. Fantastic. And we all need that. All of us. No one writes perfectly. Yeah, we see when we see good writing, we know it's intuitive. And you want to aim for that. You want to aim for just being a better writer. But equally, you want to aim for being a better writer efficiently. If you spend too long to achieve good writing, then obviously that's going to consume important time for your research. You want to be able to move quickly from your research into effective writing as part of your end product. Thank you, sir. Any other thoughts or goals for the session this morning? Yes, ma'am? Um. How to keep, so I've got a quite a complex topic and I'm having trouble keeping a clear thread throughout. So that was something I was hoping to hear Great. The golden thread. We're going to touch on that. Um, and the Crafton Research Book uses it quite effectively. And just to touch on that very briefly and to, to sort of almost deal with that from the start, they talk about keywords. And you've really got to, once you've finalized your topic and you've had your proposal approved and you really know the boundaries of your research. So yes, divergent thinking, but eventually there'll be some boundaries and then you'll converge onto an outcome. Within the boundaries of, of the landscape that you want to do your research, there'll be some keywords. And the simple practical advice that these guys offer to answer the latest question is, just make sure these keywords show up throughout your writing. Basic, simple. And have a whiteboard or, or a place where you can make some notes that's consistently visible while you're working. Our desks and our living areas often get busy and cluttered and so on, but put something up on the wall, you know, even just stickies up on the wall with those keywords. And when you're thinking and researching and writing, make sure those keywords become part of your world, your existence as a student. And then literally just make sure, if you've written out two pages in your report, or a draft of your report, and you haven't mentioned those keywords, then you're going off track. And your reader will go off track, and they'll lose the golden thread of what it is you're trying to be again. But don't do it arbitrarily. Make sure that there's meaning and purpose and additional contribution around the keywords, but blend them into your writing. Do it intentionally. Any last thoughts about goals and expectations? I've put a few up on the screen over here, all of which we will get to, and hints and tips in you know, like the keywords and so on, and then also just you know, broad important principles of writing are, are, are going to be talked through this morning as well. Any other expectations? Anything not on the board? Yes, sir? Are you going to cover a part of crazy? Um, I hadn't put it in specifically. We most certainly can. Let's have a conversation about it. I think it will be useful when we, when we hear so. Let's talk about paraphrasing. I haven't put in active and passive voice. You know, I haven't put in a lot of the grammatical techniques. We can take a day on this topic, but most certainly let's talk about paraphrasing. You remind me, and we'll come back to that. I may not be able to contribute as much to that conversation as some of the other people in the room, but I think it's, it's important as well. And it's important with um, sources and citations, because when you cross the line between actually quoting and using inverted commas to bring a source into your writing, or when you paraphrase a source to bring it in and augment it with your contribution. There's, a, there's quite a fine line as to when you're actually potentially plagiarizing by paraphrasing too much or too little. So, so there's a whole topic of paraphrasing around um, style that we can look at in the second half of this morning. Any other thoughts this morning? Any other expectations? Yes, sir. The art, fantastic. It is an art. Absolutely, it's an art. I love writing. People ask me, why do I write? Um, I, I think of, of writing like painting. And a painter has a blank canvas, and they know that when they finish that canvas, it's going to be a beautiful artwork there. And I approach my writing in exactly the same way, whether it's an article, or a blog, or a report, or a journal article. At the end of that, you're going to produce, for me, it's almost a piece of art. It's something that is 
basic contribution that somebody can appreciate, somebody can learn something from it, and something that has a, a start and an end point and a journey through that process. And as the gentleman said there, the art of academic writing. And it's absolutely, it's an art. Um, it's, it's something that we must do because we want to, because we feel passionate about it. And if you are good at writing, um, I think it then sharpens the research. Because if you're going to write well, you must research well. So you've got good content to put in your report. And if you write well, and if you're passionate about it, and it's for you, a type of art form, or whatever it is that you want to approach it, that too is going to come through in the reading of the report. Okay. So an art form. Fantastic. So good contribution. Any, any other thoughts about why, why you came to on the internet? Because the challenge of connecting the Yep. Brilliant. So you have so many different types of readers that will potentially pick up your your writing. Broadly speaking, you'll probably be able to narrow it down somewhat. But if you are writing for broad for a broad audience, again, the importance of simplicity and writing to be understood. The Stephen Covey says, um, "Listen to understand." Right? And people want to read to learn. And if you're not able to make your writing accessible to people, then they're not going to learn from you and you're not going to reach a wide audience. And it's both in this idea of the art work, as you said, the full outcome of your writing, but then it's in the journey of it, from start to finish, or as people jump around. And that's exactly what people do. When you are looking through databases and sources, you scan. You can't read a whole report. You look at the abstract, you'll look at a couple of paragraphs. Um, it's very interesting. I turned in my proposal and I sat with my supervisors and I could see he pulled up my report on his laptop. And I could see him just scanning through. You know where he stopped? This is a, it's just a little experiment. You know where he stopped? The first diagram that I put in. And I like to use diagrams to, to visualize concepts. So I think if I can break it down visually for somebody, it gives you that two-dimensional approach to something. And that was what caught his eye. So you've got to think about the diverse readership. Where somebody else might have gone straight to the abstract and says, I want to see what's in this, I'm going to the abstract. Other people go straight to methodology. So if you can think about the diversity of your readers and draw them in through all the different techniques, both in the individual writing style and the broad elements of what it is that you're writing down, then you are going to attract readers. Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Um, Self-expression, coherence, and writing. Good. Self-expression, coherence. So you are the artist. You are painting that picture. You are writing that report. It is your name <coughs> on that report. It is your contribution to knowledge. It is your degree. It is your achievement. So there must be something of you. Just researching for today, uh, we talk about Hemingway. Hemingway talks about, there's nothing to writing, I forget the quote exactly, you just sit at the typewriter and you bleed. That's what Hemingway says, you bleed. Okay? And you talk about writer's block, you talk about ways of getting through writer's block, you know, it's yourself that you're putting into. And often that writer's block is a, is a mental barrier. Because you've got so much inside you, we're all studying for a reason. We're all passionate about our subjects, otherwise we really wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be spending all this amount of time on our topic. So that, ex that expression of why it is that you're doing what you're doing, and the passion that you've got about that topic, must come through. But equally, as you mentioned coherence, it's not about a rambling narrative of excitement and discussion and debates and storytelling. That's for the conversation. That's for the discussion one-on-one -on -one, or for a different type of audience. But academic writing requires coherence. It has a generally accepted structure, different in different schools and faculties and different journals, etc. But you know academic writing when you read it. It's different from journalistic writing. It's different from blog writing. It's different from thriller writing or different from any other type of writing, or 140 characters in a tweet, okay? But, to the gentleman's point, there's always an element of self-expression in any of those mediums of written communication. Make sure that it does come through. So we will touch on that, sir. Um, 
and every one of you will, will have a different style and a way of expressing yourself. I, I do think it's important. Okay, and then I think this one's important, encouragement. So we want to just leave her feeling that encouraged. So the lady has got a complex topic that she's trying to grapple with. Um, and we've heard from other people in the room about your own academic journeys. And really I want you to leave here at the end of the morning feeling encouraged. Feeling encouraged that there are others also struggling um, to write in a second language, to be coherent in a second language, to write with self-expression and coherence in an academic style that makes a contribution um, to, to the academic literature. Okay. Um, this is great. So, so the bird sings because it has a song. There's a reason why you want to write. There's a reason that you want to express. Okay? We are not going to get the Nobel Prize for your writing. You may. And congratulations in advance. <laughs> Do not try and approach your degree to get a Nobel Prize or solve the world's problems. You're approaching your degree to write a coherent, logical, well-structured argument that makes a contribution to, to research. And you'll be awarded a degree for that subject to the rules of the school of faculty and the content that you have provided. Okay, so sing your song and be encouraged to sing your song. Here's my last point. Um, writing, I think writing words involves uh, getting to know what others are missing about what I want to write about. So I want to learn how to be able to carry out a view of literature without men just paraphrasing or without prejudice. Okay, we won't cover that in a lot of detail this morning. Um, it is in the book. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of good approaches in the book around avoiding plagiarism and bringing sources together. We will certainly touch on it, but um, having an appreciation for good writing, as you've pointed out, helps in your scanning of the rest of the literature. Why? Because other researchers and contributors who write well have approached their content with the same discipline and love of their topic. And you can tell lazy writing when you're reading through journals and scanning databases. You can very quickly see lazy, incoherent, unstructured, rambling writing. And like the lady said, it's not going to appeal to you as a reader in that person's audience. And you're going to click away, right? You know, we're in the millennial generation, we quickly, quickly click away from topics or content that doesn't draw us in. And likewise, those researchers must write well so that you feel engaged in their topic. I remember researching and I found a thesis, PhD, and I, it was so good, I read it from start to finish, like a novel. It was amazing. And it was literally that, that piece of art that you put up on the wall and said, that is an excellent thesis. You don't find any of them, but it just jumped out of me. There was a golden thread, there was self-expression, there was coherence, there was good writing style. Excellent. Okay, and you, you can pick up that good writing. And it was almost as if the content was secondary. I just knew intuitively that this researcher had a meaningful contribution to make. Because the way that communicated was effective. And it's like anything that you read. You quickly switch off if that person hasn't put effort into communicating. subjects, too many adjectives, too much paraphrasing, etc. Simply because the rules of the English language and the way they construct sentences and paragraphs have been distilled into a set of principles which have now been automated and can apply to writing as you go. Very much like the Hemingway app. Um, and if you write with the Hemingway app, it will help you as you go. And it will say, of what you've written here, two or three sentences are hard to read. Okay? One of three sentences is very hard. For example, nine phrases. And it will highlight 
the sections of your text in these colors. Now, as second language researchers, I do think this is very useful. Okay? Those of us that were fortunate or grew up with English, I think you know you have a bit of a knack for it. Also useful, uh, but it also encourage you here. Yeah? So if you don't have any adverbs, well done, good stuff. And then use of passive voice and for one of you. So then I mentioned earlier this idea of a passive and active voice. Um, and generally you want to communicate in the active voice. Okay, passive voice tends to be a little bit abstract and removed from the reality of the story that you're telling. So use the Hemingway app, use the Dribble Defense app, and then go and have some fun with the Golden Bull and Foot in Mouth Awards. And they award this to the worst writing. Okay? <laughs> and go over the website, it's really great fun. And they, they put the passages there that win these awards every year. And the one was a was a like a, a a long <laughs> sentence about, uh, uh, from a council uh, asking, somebody had written in uh, a resident uh, about some voucher system and it was just a long, rambling, very dense, difficult to understand sense of gobbledygook. But, this was coming from an elected representative, I presume somewhere in the UK potentially, that should have known better that with the power of written communication, trying to communicate effectively a simple concept, chose to waste a lot of space, confuse the reader, be lazy, and ultimately not achieve the meaningful communication that the citizen was waiting for. Foot in mouth is, um, uh, in fact, uh, last year's winner was Donald Trump, um, and they look at people, well-known people and celebrities around the world who should know better and just use written communication to make a complete hash of things, make a complete mess. And when you put something in writing, in a report or in a book or on the, on the internet, whether it's, and you guys know this, Facebook or Twitter, it's there for immemorial, right? Okay? You commit it to history. History marks you from the written word. I don't know who said that. But once you put something down on paper, and remember as well, if we plagiarize in our report, <coughs> your, your academic career is going to be in trouble. Okay? So, do not be lazy about communication. Do not put your foot in your mouth. Do not dribble. Okay? Anyway, go and have a look at these awards. And they've also got some great um, free guides. There's a page on that website, like for example, how to write in plain English. And it's very useful. Um, there wasn't one specifically on academic, um, but things like, you know, when do you use lists? We're going to talk about nominalization of verbs, for example. Okay? Um, you know, when you should or shouldn't give instructions, whether you should use a certain word or another. So I found this website very good on the topic of, of plain English and how to communicate with a little bit of fun um, building. And then again, to so this topic of, you know, learning to write is learning to think. So if, if you have a clear mind and you're able to articulate concepts, it will come through to writing. But I also believe the reverse is true. If you learn to write, okay, effectively, it can start to work in the other direction. Okay? And it can start to structure your thinking as well. So if you learn to write well, you'll start to think well. It doesn't have to be in a specific order. Okay? Some people are blessed with very structured thinking. A lot of us have a lot of thoughts coming around our minds. A lot of things going on during the day. A lot of issues that we need to deal with. Very rarely do we ever get a wonderful moment of quietness to sit down with structured thinking. You know, sometimes you can go sit in um, one of our wonderful libraries on campus and you've got some quiet time, it's fantastic. But generally our lives are busy, our thinking is unstructured. When it comes to writing, if you can put it down key and then start to approach the next writing exercise with clearer thinking based on how it affects your writing, over time I think your writing can influence your thinking as well. And that's also about writer's block. Okay? Don't try and construct a sentence in your mind before you put it on paper. Bad writing can always be turned into good writing. No writing will always be no writing. You cannot convert a blank piece of page into a better set of words and sentences. But you can take a badly written set of words and sentences and convert it to something good. Now, you will sit with a big problem if you just, you know, splurge a lot of stuff 
and then try and sort it out at the end. There's got to be some thought and planning, and we'll, we'll deal with a couple of those topics now. Okay, so right now there's some tools and topics, Hemingway app, playing English. Who have we got in the room from commerce? Anyone? Okay. Commerce, right. Sciences, these are the five, right? Engineering, okay. Health sciences, anybody? Humanities, okay, right, good. Humanities, okay. Do you feel that your approach to writing is different from any of these others over here? Humanities. Do you? Okay. Why was I? Well, a lot of young faculties um, go for scientific approaches, rational approaches, whereas humanities, although a certain amount of people go for these rational, statistical approaches, many go for qualitative. It's not so much as how many children fail school, but what caused them to fail? Predisposing factors. We also need to know the qualitative aspects. So our approaches are different in that regard. Okay, and that may come through in the style and the structure of your writing. Because you're writing with a slightly different methodology and you're writing with a slightly different approach. So whether it's qualitative or quantitative, the actual content of your sentences might differ. And the way in which you want to be effective in that communication might also have a different flavor. Right? And you might use some of the tools and techniques and principles of effective writing slightly differently based on the input now around humanity is being slightly different and more qualitative and almost narrative and descriptive in a sense than the rational, scientific, deductive faculties. Okay, engineering and sciences in the room, or even commerce, you guys, any thoughts on, on writing in your field? I yes. disagree. Yes? I come from a humanities background and now I'm in commerce management and style, while the content is Different. Yep. The style of writing is exactly the same. Okay. So you think it's important to communicate effectively no matter what field you're in? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Disagreements? Agreements? We can disagree, guys. We can have good, robust debates. Yes, sir. Um, I come from uh, the management field, but uh, for some strange reason, I found myself to having to use humanities approach in terms of yeah. my work, which was quite a disjoint in terms of the understanding of the faculty. Yeah. Because I mean, they were like, now what are you going to do? And from time to time, I have to take them to say, no, 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 I'm not doing quali quantitative study, I'm doing qualitative. So their thinking yeah. is very qualitative, quantitative. Okay. And I mean, uh, there's always that tension. But I mean, it's very, very interesting. It is interesting, and if I think of the, the papers that I've scanned through the humanities and the others, there is a lot more text in the humanities papers. There is more diagrams and facts and figures in the engineering. But I, I sort of, I mean, the point made here was that what, when you drill it down to the, the sentence and the word choice and the construction and the, the, the discipline around that art form of communicating in the written word, you know, your style is still important. Your, your, your approach from a methodological perspective might be different. But ending up with that sentence there still requires structured thinking and clear thinking and a disciplined approach to your to your topic. Right? I think I think to, to turn it around, you could identify lazy writing in humanities and engineering and commerce just as easily. Right? It just will stand up the boat. You would never excuse lazy writing in humanities, for example, just because it's more narrative, narrative and qualitative. Equally, you wouldn't say, well, the engineering guys have got a lot easier because they get to put facts and figures and graphs and diagrams into their reports. Trust me, if you're in the engineering world, if everybody is doing that, it's no advantage. All right? You've still got to communicate clearly and effectively. And equally, if everybody's in a world where it's a lot more text and narrative and storytelling, you've got to rise above everyone else's stories. Okay? So what is the differentiator in that? It's the written word that the teacher communicate Any other thoughts? On that. No offense to the medical profession, I see there aren't any in the room. My father had terrible handwriting and I could never read it. Now, let's talk about this process of um, 
planning your report, and we're really not going to go into too much detail of all these. Um, we touched on it briefly earlier, but this is now when you're at the stage in your degree where you are now thinking about your report. And who's at that stage in their, their studies at the moment? I know you are as well. Anybody else? Yes? A couple of you? Who's in sort of the uh, middle of their research? Just still gathering data over here? Okay. You, who's in a proposal stage? Okay, okay. Alright, so I think in the, the sort of beginning and the end of your research is where effective writing, have you submitted a proposal? You know? No. No, not Okay, so you're still going to have to write a proposal. Yeah, I'm going to have to do it. Must be good. Okay, so you are, you are producing a document and you still have an opportunity now to demonstrate clarity and meaning um, in the way that you express yourself. So this can apply to you know, the proposal stage or um, even at the end point um, of your research. So as we said earlier, it's not a narrative of your thinking. It may be a narrative of the research and there is a type of inquiry called narrative inquiry. That is different. I'm not talking about that. Narrative of thinking is I woke up this morning, I got out of bed, I went to have breakfast, and then I went to walk the dog, and then I had lunch, and I came back, and then I went to the movies, and I came home, I had dinner, etc. Your reader doesn't want to know the running commentary of what you did. Okay. You will go on a journey that has many twists and turns, okay? and you will navigate the route. But once you've established the best route from the start to the finish, it's not the route that you took, it's the route that other readers must take. You're not going to tell them to go on all the squiggles and tributaries and roundabouts, detours, etc. that you went in your research. Equally, the reader is looking at the map that you created. They're not walking that map with you, even if it is a better route. They want an understanding and an awareness and a contribution to them of how they would take that route to achieve the results that you did. Okay, so just be careful of, of creating a story, writing a story. It might be a research of stories, and storytelling comes through, and I know that's a, a big element of, of qualitative research. It's a patchwork of your sources. Also, very evidence, high evidence of, of lazy writing. It's just to amalgamate different sources, and we spoke about, uh, earlier about paraphrasing. And let's just touch on the topic of paraphrasing. So, and I really urge you to read in the book. You have to Practice, number one, when you bring sources into your material, whether you paraphrase them and embed your argument into the paraphrasing of that source, or whether you quote them directly and build on that quotation. Right? And you have to practice doing this. You have to get good at understanding what you will achieve with each of those different approaches. And bear in mind, as I said, if you don't paraphrase effectively, you could be actually plagiarizing. Okay. So I think when in doubt, quote fully. All right. But the point that I'm making here is when you look at your report, okay, and yes, you're going to have a literature review, which is a lot more about sources, but you find lazy researchers will then bring other sources into the rest of their report, almost like a continuation of their literature review, simply for, for padding or giving in an extra material. You need to make a contribution to your field. You need to express what it is that you've concluded from the work that you've done. So make sure that your, your work is not just uh, uh, an amalgamation of your sources. It probably will be to a great list of being a literature review. And again, remember the paraphrasing versus plagiarizing. A reflection of your assignment. So if you're going to write something and you've got an intention to write it based on an approved proposal, okay, that's your starting point. And there must be a golden thread that starts with that approved proposal, which flows through your research, flows into a report, and is evident in that. But it's very unlikely that it would just be a, an automatic reflection of that proposal, because one or two or three years have moved on, your results have come through, you take on down certain tributaries, you must answer the question, but don't reflect the question. Don't, uh, uh, don't answer the question by reconstructing the question itself. I'm not talking about the actual sentence, I'm talking about the research that you do in time. So fully expect that your proposal is a starting point and it's always a, something to go back to. If you go down a detour, you come back to your proposal. But the end, the golden route that you take through your research is going to end up somewhere slightly differently from where you started. 
As long as you can show that delta in your writing, people will accept that you've gone on a journey and you've made a contribution as a result of it. They don't just automatically reflect from where you started. All right, introductions are, are quite tricky and I think they do differ quite significantly across um, the, the schools and the faculties. Um, and again, it goes to this topic almost the second one here of the golden thread. You almost want to, to you know, get to that, that introduction thinking as soon as possible. You, know, you almost want to think, well, if somebody stopped me in the elevator, we have a cup of tea at the break and you talk to me about your research, what is it that you're saying? That introduction is so powerful as the, the lens almost into the rest of the details. So when we scan in papers, we go and look at the abstract, and we read a little bit of the introduction, and then we cherry pick the sections in that report that are useful to us. So as part of planning the report, make sure that you, you start getting a good uh, working introduction in place. We've spoken quite a lot about the golden thread, and uh, this idea that if you bring keywords through the sentences and paragraphs, not mechanically, not just for the sake of putting the keywords in the text, but as a checkpoint against whether you yourself are writing with a golden thread. It's a useful mechanism. And probably go around all the six or seven at the most kind of keywords that you put up on your wall somewhere next to your desk, the big stickies. You know, make sure that, that, and I also like to draw a Venn diagram, so you know you've got a, a topic, and then you've got an overlapping topic, and then maybe another one, and then I'm really interested in where this and this come together. That intersection of the Venn diagram is your golden thread. Now, you could go outside of that and then come back into it, fine, because you're going into explore this area to inform the detail that you're interested in. And, and you go back into another circle and back into another so you come back here. But that golden thread must be there all the way through. So find a way of identifying and maintaining the golden thread without your your research report. Okay. Um, then there's this idea of planning. And as I said, I'm not going to, to, to go into detail in the book. You really must, must, must have a look at that. But, and you must find a balance as to how much you can use storyboard. Okay, is anybody in movies and theatre and drama in the room? Okay, so, so, so in, the, in the movies they storyboard, okay? And when they talk about putting a series together, you usually watch Generations or lots of our soapies and wonderful SNBC uh, um, series, etc. and MNET and all those two. When they're planning an episode, they storyboard it, okay? And storyboarding is saying, well, I know what I want to have at 5 minutes, I know I want to have 10 minutes, and 15 minutes, and 20 minutes, and there'll be a, a picture of that. And I'll say, right, so this is where the plot will have developed by at this point. And then they draw a picture, and then the artists come in, and the set constructors will do it. And then they fill in the detail around the storyboarded components. So at the top here, you know, you could take the movie, and you could almost break it up into 10, 15, or 20 minute sections. The same is true of your artwork, your research artwork. Get the big components mapped out. And again, the stickies idea. You know, below your keywords, take some stickies and say, okay, so in this area of my report, and there are certain structures and, and ways of writing reports in the different faculties, and make sure that you structure accordingly. But each of them will have outcomes that you want to achieve through your writing. So that's what planning the sections and subsections of the body of your report is all about. Okay? Because besides abstract introduction, literature review, and then conclusions and recommendations at the end, the body of your report is your contribution. Okay? And it's, it's fairly flexible. You, know, you have results, etc. And you discuss, right? Now, discuss, tell us, talk about it. Play your movie, show us your artwork. Right, and remember it's a linear process so that the analogy for the movie is much better than the artwork. Because when you see a painting, you absorb it all in one go. When you watch a movie, you go through it. When you read a report, you go through it. Right, you can flick backwards and forwards. When you go to the beginning of that DVD, you can flick to one section or another of the movie. And likewise, people are going to flick through the sections of your report. Make sure there's a golden thread in each one of them, but make sure that before you go into that exercise of actually writing, you've planned it out. 
Because although the two or three or number of years that you've been through is all these backwards and forwards and frustrating ups and downs and times when you wanted to give up and times when it was just so clear for you, you now need to start sketching the map for other people to take a better route through your results to achieve at that conclusion. You can't just now sit down and, and, and write a perfect map. You need to, to sketch it up. Now, this is the hardest part here. When do you actually start the writing of the words that will be in the final report? Okay? And again, a balance, guys. So I put two thoughts there. If you start too early, you get less value from your plan. It's like anything. You can plan to the nth degree. But you have to start executing at some point. Equally, you can start, so if you start too early, you're, you're planning, and you're kind of saying, well, the plan is there, but I'm going to get on it. Right? You must benefit from your plan, because you must go back to your plan as you execute it. So as you get to a certain section, you say, now, did I achieve this milestone in my storyboard? Yes or no? Let's calibrate. Maybe there's a reason I did it, and that's intentional. Fine. But now I'm still that in course with my plan. And the chances are, most of us are going to start too late anyway. So I think as an advice or a tip or a trick, take away, start earlier than you think. Start earlier than you think you should. Have a plan, do some planning, but don't let it eat into valuable time that you have to actually produce that piece of art, that movie, that report that you need to create. And most of us are going to rush for a deadline in any way. So all this planning, wonderful analysis and ideas that we have around how we're going to structure it, it's going to be out the window at 3 o'clock in the morning when you've got to head into your supervisor at 9 o'clock that morning, right? Okay. So I, I'm, I'm more in, in this camp. I draft early. Okay, so who in this room here is more in the camp of starting to draft early? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, so the rest of you, you value your plan, you'll get to it at some point. So my advice is, start earlier than you think you should. Now let's get an idea, masters, students in the room? Masters, okay, PhDs? Okay, so it's quite a mix, okay. All right, does that make sense? Any thoughts, guys? Any thoughts about this balance between, you know, the planning and the executing of the actual writing? And you must be comfortable. So find the right balance. It's your balance. No one else will balance. No one can tell you when you absolutely must stop. But I go back to this idea of you can always fix bad writing. You can't actually fix a bad painting. So something that paints, they paint. That's it. It's there. Right. An editor in the studio of a movie is going to splice and change things and move sections around until they produce that perfectly edited movie that you go and watch at the movies. But the process that went into it was lots of factors and forwards. Okay. One thought as well on this is try and <coughs> introduce a degree of generative writing in your research. So as you go through your, your, your interviews or your laboratory work or whatever it is that you're doing to generate the results and, and whatever else is the content of the research, write as you go. Write for someone that's interested in your, in your research. Start a blog. Write an article for the BITS newspaper. Write an article for your faculty. Write a poster that goes on the wall in your school. Admin blog, whatever the case may be. <coughs> Present at a conference. <coughs> Write a journal article. That, that is the apex of, of academic contribution to knowledge and will get read the most by my kind of people in the field. Because once you do that and you practice writing, when you come to actually writing your final report, you've already got all of this great content that you put together that you can start drawing on. That's the one thing. The second is, your mind is already attuned to the writing process. Okay, because as we said earlier, you put a proposal together, there's a fair bit of writing and the defense of it and the approval of it, and then you think, oh, thank goodness, now I can go and do my research. But that report has got your name on it, and it's calling your name. Okay. Don't be scared of it. Start thinking about it as early as possible. Alright. Any other thoughts on this idea of, of we could spend a couple of hours yesterday? Um, 
My name is Stephen. I wanted to know, um, where is the place for writing and outlining the entire report? Brilliant, yeah. So it's yeah. So, so your, your outline, so your plan, could be the elements that you want. And you can do that with an outline. Now, I was just using sticky notes, but as Stephen has correctly pointed out, you could write an outline. And, and the advice for people is tell somebody what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. So the outline is telling people what you're going to put in your report. And it's often a very good technique when you come to that stage to agree with your supervisor how your report is going to be structured. Okay? And what they can expect to see in that report, which you then just need to go in and fill the gaps. So Stephen's made a very valuable point there. The plan here could be an outline itself. So you say, this section, I'm going to talk about these topics, I'm going to bring in this source, I'm going to go into these word results. I haven't done them yet, I've done half of them, and then this section, and you literally write it down and introduce it. And this is where the generator writing becomes quite useful. Because you're taking slices of your work and your contribution, and you're digesting it. And you're talking about how it is that you're going to ultimately present it. So an outline is a very good idea. That's a great tip that I suggest you take away and go and Google and have a look at in terms of some ideas. Alright, last thoughts on planning. Drafting! Okay, so be comfortable. And as I said, this idea of balance and comfort it's your, it's a self-expression, okay? It's, it's your plan, it's your outline, it's your report. It's you sitting at your desk, writing your report. So be comfortable in your flow. Get into a flow, get into a zone of writing. Turn the internet off, turn Facebook off, turn your phone off. Turn everything off. Be comfortable and focus. I'm not talking physically comfortable, absolutely you need to be physically comfortable. But be comfortable in your style of writing. Don't try and copy the way other people write. Don't try and do exactly what they write in the book that I've spoken about this morning. Take all of those on board. We are professionals, right? We are advanced students in one of the greatest universities in the world, right? We're all capable of adapting all of that to our own approach to, to writing in the academic world. Okay. Now, then again, this idea of keywords in the golden thread, use the keywords to stay on track. So monitor your paragraphs as you go, all the way through. Just use a little yellow highlighter, maybe, in your, in your document as you go. And just make sure that those keywords are, are coming through. And they're literally just dotted around. Um, and, and the movie guys do it exactly the same. So if they are producing a romantic comedy, guess what? There needs to be romance and comedy throughout the movie, okay? If you are putting out a horror movie, there needs to be scary moments all the way through. It's logical, okay? If you're writing about a specific topic, that topic needs to almost have a washing line. You can think about a washing line. And a washing line doesn't just stand up by itself. It needs support all the way through so that you can get that golden thread. And it creates, if you get the keywords of the golden thread right, it creates these wonderful little spaces within which your self-expression really comes through quite strongly. So if you introduce a paragraph about a certain topic, link it back to your golden thread with a couple of keywords, and then guys, enjoy the four or five sentences within that paragraph that is your writing. That is your little space within that paragraph because you've bracketed it nicely, you've introduced it, you've linked it back to your golden thread and your topic, but now you can go in and play. Obviously, finish off that paragraph and bring in those keywords again so you've bracketed it nicely. But that little section that you've created in there is your space to go in and contribute to knowledge. You do not think of your entire report as a contribution to knowledge. Because people need to get access to it. People that are knowledgeable in your field need to know how they can dive in and learn and evaluate the contribution that you made to knowledge. So create the space, bring them in, and then say, guys, this is what I'm thinking. Show the keywords, show the golden thread, adopt the formalities of the way that you need to produce your report, but then within that, express yourself. Narratively or quantitatively or qualitatively. Okay, then this, we talk about paraphrasing again, summarize appropriately, and again, guys, there's, 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 there's great material in the book um, about this topic. Um, we spoke about the integration of direct quotations, and 
Um, I think if it's half a sentence or something like that, and there's different, uh, you, you can bring it in line with your text for half a sentence. If it's more than three or four lines, you need to take a break and then show the, 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 the quotation with an indent, etc. Just make sure you get all of those topics right. So on the one end of the spectrum, there's the paraphrasing, and you make a reference to, in your bibliography, uh, XYZ 2011 talks about emissions of coal gases, for example. You know, and somebody will go and read them. Okay, and then you're going to go into them. Or you need to bring a specific element of his research in, and you say he found XYZ in his results, and you're still paraphrasing. <laughs> But as soon as you start to quote directly and you lift that content out of that paper, you then either need to put quotations in line or you separate it out, indent it, and then it's three or four lines with a little bit of a paragraph that you quote. Sorry? Yes? Can I just ask? Um, regarding the quotations, I think uh, many studies seem to be arguing that uh, that's not the preferred way. Quote as little as possible. Yep. And if possible, point in the quote. Yeah. Um, that is the and I think that's that? that, I mean, many of the like APA, yeah. Harvard, you know, that is especially for PhDs. I mean they tend to be very, very strong about yeah. the the frequency of quoting or the lack of. So so again I go back to uh, where did I put it now? It's not a patchwork of sources, right? Mm -hmm. So if if you're thinking about your research and you're you're too reliant on your sources. It's going to come through your thinking, and it's going to come through your writing exactly as the gentleman said, and there'll be lots of quotation marks. Right? So, again, find the right balance, but if you are too reliant on sources, it'll come through lots of quotation marks. Equally, to establish credibility in your field, you must have immersed yourself in the sources. You must be able to quote if it supports your argument in the report at that specific point. But whether you quote too much or too little or too frequently or too infrequently must be driven by the point you're trying to get across, not by padding a report or completing your research. Okay, guys. Yes, you've got an end log, but you want quality. So do it properly. Make sure that you think about it. And again, um, this one here of, of starting too early or too late. If you're starting too late, chances are you're going to be a bit desperate for content and text and you're going to bring in sources. If you start a bit earlier, you've got time to think about how you properly integrate and paraphrase the sources. And as a gentleman says, as you progress in your academic research career, you're expected to think more and more for yourself. And the people can go and look at the sources. A person that is esteemed and knowledgeable in your field will know the sources. You don't have to tell them what they wrote. I was in a, a lecture at Wittsburg, it wasn't a lecture, it was a colloquium. And um, I was amazed, I was actually stunned, this business school, how these guys could quote from paragraphs and sections of reports, and you'll find in the different fields, the guys know the sources. Whether you know the sources comes through better in integrating paraphrases, paraphrased writing, paraphrased writing, okay? So the ability to describe what has been researched and established by who, and how it supports and fits in with what you're talking about is a, is a skill that you need to learn and will only come from practice. Okay. Um, and then I think it links here to, to show how evidence is relevant. So don't just quote or paraphrase and then you go to something unrelated. You've got to create this link between, well, he says this and I disagree because of X. Or, I would extend his argument according to these three topics which I'll cover in the remainder of this section. Okay. Or, when you combine two findings or two sources, you know, he says this and she says that, they agree on these two points, they disagree on these five points. And I'm interested in going into more detail on the third and the fifth, for example. So, you're, you're taking your reader through a journey. Now, remember, your journey was all over the place, right? Because you read that source and then you went down that source and this one and he came back. You have to present a coherent, <coughs> love that word the gentleman usually, a coherent path through the sources. Does somebody want to put the kettle on for us? Sorry. Just, none of you reminded me. So you were too absorbed. Um, what we did, which is good I suppose. Okay. Guard against inadvertent plagiarism. Get your citations right. Okay, now these are the topics that we've been talking about just now. 
uh, lots of tips and tricks in the book, and also read, as I said, when I read that thesis, that just was a really great piece of work for me, read good authors. And a good tip is on your databases, and most of them should be able to do this, sort your sources by the number of <coughs> citations. If other people are referring and referencing that work, it's good. Okay. So look at, you'll always see all the databases, it'll show you the number of times this has been cited. Okay. You should be referencing those works and reading them more than the others. And that, that goes to show, right? I mean, it's like the Amazon five-star rating on a book or something in the store. Or the like, the like button on the Facebook post. Yeah? Okay. Lots of likes. You know, democratized information and awareness of what is quality and what is not considered. It's not to say there isn't some great stuff in the lesser cited books. And that's not to say that you shouldn't be disruptive and controversial in your thinking and say, yes, but he said this and everyone disagreed with him or nobody actually read his report, but I actually really like it. Awesome. Do that. Put yourself out there. That's a, it's a form of self-expression as well. Okay. Maybe there are other forces at work that you want to expose as to why that research hasn't been well cited, just as an example. Procrastination and writer's block. Any tips quickly for, for getting through writer's block or procrastination? Yes, ma'am. Um, free writing. Great. Generative writing or free writing? So I use the term generative writing. Free writing, absolutely. Yeah, I've literally written, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I need to have a couple of paragraphs there and actually finish them. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so did you all hear that? So when you literally do not know what to write, write down, I do not know what to write. <laughs> I see that lady there's, so you and you need to have a conversation at the break. Because it works, I promise you. And it links back to the point I made earlier. You can always turn some sort of writing into better writing. No writing is always going to be no writing. Okay. Good point the lady there made. And to be honest with you guys, if you're sitting there, Really thinking that you want to be somewhere else. Or doing something else. Don't do it. Don't do it. The series is on TV or that. You know, you want to binge watch House Cards or Game of Thrones or whatever it is. Go do it. Seriously. Go do it. Don't, don't. But then your guilt, you have to deal with your guilt. And it's your guilt that's going to get you back to that computer. Okay? But don't prove why you actually should be sitting at your desk, right? Because you have the privilege and the good fortune of being able to study and to, to earn a degree. Okay. And then my preference is I reward myself afterwards, right? I'm going to do a thousand words, then I'm going to go watch House of Cards. Okay? That, that, that's my mechanism. Okay. But then sometimes it's an artificial deadline, but at least I've got something down on paper and I can come back to it the next day. And sleep on it. So often, you know, you'll come back in the morning and you and I work best at night. I'm a night owl. So I do my best work from ten until two in the morning. Okay, and I'm not an early bird necessarily. Sometimes I can come back to what I've written, and you have a different perspective on it. And that subconscious process that goes through as your synapses refresh. It's important to sleep, and you must sleep. Okay, as they are refreshed, you have a, a new lens to to look at your own writing. Okay, so that's one aspect there. Um, think like a reader. Sounds very really obvious, but again, all of the things that I'm talking about now are as you go, right? It's different to come back once you've got everything and then retrofit all of these things because then you might have to be rewriting every sentence. And you are not going to have time to rewrite every sentence. You, as you are drafting, some of your content has to be retained. You will not have time to rewrite your entire report three or four times. Yeah. You can re reconstruct it and reorganize it and move sections around and change sentences, etc. But as you go, think like somebody that's reading the final result. And what I do is a simple trick is if I'm not comfortable with a certain section or I want to make notes, then just make the notes in line and yellow highlight. And then when you're scanning later on, you go back. And if you can't sort out a source, just yellow highlight, make a little comment. There are all these tools in Word or whatever 
document uh, editor system you're using to, to write your report. Just quickly, paragraph lengths. Um, you definitely want to go over a page, but sort of anything less than five lines isn't really a paragraph. You know a good solid paragraph when you come to it. And this is convention, I suppose. But it also means that you're not blabbering on for a page about a concept, but you're equally not just lightly skipping over it. And a paragraph must be a concept on its own. And typically, you'll introduce it with relation to the previous paragraph, the keywords of your goal and thread, and then as I said, go in and create a nice little space for yourself in there, those three or four sentences, and then finish it off and move on to the next point. Okay? Now, there are three main patterns for doing abstracts. Okay? Um, and different schools and faculties use different patterns, and this is on page 211 of the book. So, the first two set of context, right? What is the context of this research? So, I've picked up this report and I want to know, roughly speaking, what is that Venn diagram? So, I've got architecture as a massive topic, or I've got whatever other topic is you can think of, mechanical engineering. But what is that Venn diagram of areas? that this researcher, I'm going to read it now, that this researcher is wanting me to start converging onto. Okay, so set context. Okay? Then there's a problem. Why, why are you researching in that Venn diagram of topics? Okay? And you will typically identify a problem in the overlap of those topics, those circles. And if you write circles and then you overlap, inside there, there's an intersection of ideas. And you say, well, when I look at this type of architecture in this type of an economy, I see this problem. And this is why I'm going to do some research. Now, you can either then make the point of your entire research and give them the answer on the first page, which a lot of researchers don't like to do. They want to keep someone in suspense. They want to keep the reader in suspense all the way through to the end. Okay? And you have some reports which will have a conclusion. But generally speaking, more than I've read, the convention is that you'll bring that main point, launching point or summary right into the abstract. Why? Because abstracts are what gets published on all the databases. So you should be able to read that abstract and really get a sense of the report. You don't have to go into the report to find out what was that summary of, of the results. Or another abstract pattern is just to summarize what you've done and to tell a little bit of a story about it. But I, I, I sometimes want to grap grapple with how you would get away from creating some sort of context and a problem statement with them, either a launching point into the rest of the document or a conclusion that is self-sufficient and stands on its own. You can take it out and when you are famous one day and you are introduced at the conference, they will say, Mr. X found this result in his work at Wits University. And that's what should be in that last sentence or two of the abstract. Okay. I really recommend you to go and have a look at page 230 and 231 of the book. They have all the different types of graphs and graphics. It was very funny. In this medical book that I picked up at the bookshop earlier today, they had graphs in there. And they showed different types of graphs and bar charts and stuff. And the, the author really was showing how he did not like it when people took simple bar graphs and turned them in 3D and like made an angle out of it and then you know, he almost said like, it looks like skyscrapers, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? So you can do these things in all of these tools that we have, but does it inform the reader's journey through your work? Does it create clear and concise understanding or results or data in terms of graphs and graphics, etc.? that complements the flow and structure of your argument. Okay. So don't just do fancy graphs and graphics because you can. As I said earlier, when my supervisor scanned through my report, the first diagram was what caught his eye. So he was looking at my report from a, for an arm's length, scanning through it, and he just stopped at the first diagram. And it meant that that diagram, for me, was an opportunity to hook that type of reader. But don't underestimate it. But do it wise, do it properly, choose wisely, get them right. Okay. Um, introductions, common ground, problems, responses, guys, have a look at the book. It's a, it's a broad topic as well. Um, common ground, as you well know, is just about saying, in the context of your research, establish the facts, and usually from sources, 
So make sure that you've done your literature review exhaustively, because if you're going into ground that is already established, your examiners will, will pack you, right? Okay. So you haven't done an exhaustive literature review. But once you've established that common ground, and you said, well, these are the main sources, this are the main results that they've found, okay? We've established that common ground of existing literature. I've now described where it is that I want to state a problem for which I think I've found a solution, or I'm going to present a solution. That common ground against which you will present a problem and a response must come through in your thinking and your approach to the way that you work. And of course, different sections of your report are usually structured to achieve each of those outcomes there. I don't think I've got another slide. Um, Time for break, guys. Any, any final thoughts on you know, planning and executing your report? And really, that was a, a very quick overview. Um, and there's lots more we can do. I don't want to compromise our time after break when we go into a little bit of more detailed sentence construction. Any thoughts on drafts before we go off? Is there anybody that feels now they maybe need to start their draft tonight, potentially? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for the contributions this morning. I think there'll be great uh, thoughts and suggestions coming through. Let's have a cup of tea, guys. And if we can come back at 5 past 11, please. Thank you.